All right, got it. All right, so hello and welcome to another episode of All Things Tanny Radio Shack. And I'm here again with <laughs> with Paul's T-shirt, <laughs> with Paul Shriver. We're, I'm really excited about this part because we're going to be talking about some of the juicy concepts that c- ever came out of any computer manufacturing center. We left off, the last thing that you said was that AST had just purchased Radio Shack. All right. Tandy, Tandy. Oh, excuse me, Tandy. That's true. Radio Shack's a separate store. And I, I really do believe that at that time, that was the beginning of the end. I was just reading a clip about how immediately 700 American jobs were lost the moment that happened. What were your thoughts when you heard about that? Well, I think immediately is unfair. It was three weeks. So let's not quibble over who killed who. Mm. Um, Interesting. So the story behind AST, of course, AST was a customer of ours. Uh, They were a computer clone manufacturer um, in Orange County, Irvine, California. And I had designed some modems for them, for AST. And we didn't consider them a really big competitor because they were more kind of high end. They had a little military business sort of off to the side and they didn't have retail outlets like Radio Shack had a retail outlet. So we knew of them, but we didn't think, <clears throat> pardon me, we didn't think that much about them. Okay. We didn't lay in bed at night going, oh my God, AST. So Sorry. That's no, okay. You're a busy man. We know I this. It says link your Android phone. I don't even own an Android phone. But anyway, I'll turn my iPhone off. The, the issue... Android. Around, right. So that was you, <laughs> not me. So the issue around, I'll say, starting in early 93, was that there were probably at that time... 30 companies that made PC clones. Who can remember companies like, you know, Eagle Computers and uh, Gateway with the cows? Oh, I remember Gateway. And and you got Computer Shopper Magazine that was this thick and there were 50,000 people in there. There was a lot of fly, uh, there was a real great one at one time. It was Computer uh, Arch Rival, only out for a few months, but they sold great. Right, and then there was e-machines and all those kinds. I remember of those. Right, this computer will never go obsolete. Wow, <laughs> had a sticker on the front. So, th- so there was no shortage of personal computers, but there was a shortage of Intel processors. Oh, really? Still at that time there was, huh? Well, this is the start of the shortage. Not still, but the start of the shortage. I get you. Was, was around... 92, 93. Because I know that Ryzen's uh, AMDs are shortage right now. Bad, hard to get. Right, especially That's Ryzen. many years later. Ryzen 9s, not Ryzen 7s. You can get Ryzen 7s. I just got a Ryzen 7, and my sister bought a Ryzen 7 notebook, but not a Ryzen 9. Yeah. But this, we're talking, we're talking 486s here, okay? And so Intel put people in what's called allocation. And allocation means... If you're not on our list, you're not going to get any processors. Mm, Wow. So Intel decided to put the top five people on allocation. And AST was number six. Mm. Mm. No CPUs for you. Well, they had a backlog. Everybody has a backlog, you know, parts. But the backlog started getting thin, and they thought, well, maybe Intel will put us off of allocation, and, but it didn't seem to happen. And so AST started to run out of processors. So they went to Intel and said, what if we bought a company in the top five? Can we get processors? And Intel said, sure. Okay. How often does a smaller company buy a larger company? It was rare at the time. I, it was I, I rare, it was... but AST was clever. People like yourself still associate Tandy and Radio Shack as the same thing. 
but I still it, do that. But AST didn't. So Intel was thinking, who they're going to buy? Dell, IBM, HP, Compaq, Radio Shack. That was the top five, right? Dell, HP, Compaq, IBM, Radio Shack. Not necessarily in that order. That's the top five. Who are they going to buy? Well, the answer was they're going to buy Tandy. They're going to buy Radio Shack. They're going to buy Tandy. No one thought of that. So they came in to Tandy and mm. said, we want to buy a Tandy. Interesting. And, of course, this was immediately after the two most wildest successful products in the history of American consumer electronics, the VIS and the Sensation. And Tandy said, please, fire sale. Sold. So they sold Tandy to AST. They had a big meeting at the Tandy Technology Center, which is our new building outside the Twin Towers, right across the street. And the CEO, so AST were the three initials of the last people who founded. There's three guys from India that founded the company. So that S was a guy named Safi. And so he was the CEO. He was the S and AST. And so he flew in and he gave a speech that I'll tell you if anybody out there who gets bought, if the new CEO gives you the speech, you immediately quit and run away. And the speech has this following phrase. The only thing that's gonna change is the name on your paycheck. Well, yeah, it's going to change, in our case, the Texas Unemployment Commission. <laughs> right. So he, gave, he literally said that. All the engineers looked at each other and said, are there two E's in resume? And within three weeks, he laid off a third of all the Tandy employees. Yeah, that's what I remember reading. After he promised nothing will change but the name on your paycheck. I was three long weeks, gone by then. Three weeks later, a third of the employees were gone. Wow. They only wanted the Intel allocation. They didn't give a, pardon my French, if you say in Texas, they didn't give a rat's ass about <laughs> our IP. Our it, was, it was apparent. They wanted Intel chips in AST computers. And at that, that time, AST was, they thought they were so great because they had the modular boards, the all in one boards. Where you could right. go ahead and pull one out, pull one out, another one in. You got a whole new system. They thought that was going to be the thing, and it just was a complete flop. Bill. Well, it it, it kind of got them there, right? Because they did the ISA cards. It's got it's a floppy drive. It's a video controller. It's a real time clock. It's a light. It really took off, though, not that I right. recall. But but that but people knew them for that. Yes. But they made their money selling to customers you never heard of. They would go after government contracts like the U.S. Post Office. Well, they seem are, smart that way. You know, they, they, they didn't care about selling one computer. Their average PO from their customers was 6,000 computers. Wow. That's, that's where they went. They did not go for onesie twosies. They had no, they had no way to sell onesie twosies. They went after large government. You know, I remember seeing bids for 50,000 computers at a time, okay? That's what AST was going for. They didn't care about selling one, all right? So my job was the Grim Reaper. In fact, no, that's what they call me. Really? They called you me had the that Grim role? Reaper. Yes. The reason I had that role was I was the only licensed professional engineer in all of Tandy Corporation. Wow. So legally, you can't even call yourself an engineer unless you're a licensed professional engineer, which means you've taken a test and you're licensed by the state and you have a little plaque and you have this little cool stamp that you stamp on drawings like a civil engineer, you can't call yourself an engineer. That's okay. why they started calling people member of the technical staff, okay? Not engineer. Well, I was an engineer, so I got to put engineer on my business card. Well, AST, said we have to have a PE to gather up the IP, intellectual property, schematics, floppy disks with code on it, draw, mechanical drawings for the cabinet, for the cases, because that's our property, all right? Now, 
It didn't matter if AST had no intention, they just stuck it all in the shredder, okay? But to make it a legal transaction between corporations, you have to give the appearance of what we call in the business due diligence, okay? So I was in charge of the due diligence, which means I had a giant Rubbermaid trash bin on wheels and I would roll it up to your cube after you got laid off and I would go through all your personal files and throw away memos that you kept about they're gonna strike the parking lot on Thursday versus here's the schematic for the model 4,000. What did the staff think about you then? Did they understand? Oh, they thought it was great. They actually made me a t-shirt that said, so if you know Monty Python and the Holy Grail, there's a scene, bring out your dad, bring out your dad. So they put a picture of the guy with the, with the card. What a group. Bring out your dad. And then send me wheel in my little card and I'll go, bring out your dad, bring out your dad. Okay. And I, I did that for about eight months. And when you go through your colleagues' files, you find all kinds of cool things that you're like, this guy? Hmm. I think I'll just throw, save that one for possible use later. <laughs> oh, wow. You know. Um, of information. Right. And so, and so that was after, so, so no designs were done. The last computer design by Tandy was the SX4025. I think it's called the 40, or 4025 SX. I forget. It had 4025 in it. Okay. That was a 25 megahertz. 46, uh, you know, just a little PC, nothing special. That was the last official computer we did. So before that, I did the Sensation 2, then the Sensation 1, then the VIS. And then before I did those computers, I worked on Radio Shack voltmeters. And since I was a PE, I had to do patent offense and defense, either filing for patents or when companies sued us, claiming a patent violation or a safety violation, which is through UL, Underwriters Laboratories. You've seen all, you've all seen the little UL stickers on our power strips and stuff. I, I had to review it because that's the Texas law. Was that common, lawsuits like that? We were sued an average of three times a day, every, every day for 45 years. Oh my gosh. Now this is everything from people slipping in the store and falling to IBM saying, we're going to sue you for a billion dollars and everything in between. Okay. But legally you have to treat every single one with the same level of importance. Okay. Whereas you can't just blow it off because you go, oh, forget this people. Okay. So Tandy had some good lawyers. They had a whole floor of lawyers, an entire floor. Wow. Plus for the patent stuff, we had three outside firms that we used to both file patents and to defend patents because patent attorneys are double attorneys. They have two bar degrees. They have a standard Juris Doctor Law degree. Then you have to pass the patent bar, which is a whole separate thing. So they're very rare and very expensive to have a patent attorney. So we, we had one patent attorney for the whole company, but starting about 1984, we started getting floods of patent lawsuits. Usually before that, they were either personal injury stuff or they were what we call um, product liability. Like um, one of my favorite stories about that, was we had a very rich person here in Fort Worth whose house burned down and it was all our fault. And he blamed a Radio Shack power strip for burning. This is, this is about 1990. This is a $3 million house in 1990, okay? Wow. And it burned to the ground. And when you do lawsuits, you have what's called discovery where you give depositions and it's basically the investigation. Well, we found out we ask him, where, where was the power strip? He says, well, it was underneath my saltwater aquarium. Saltwater aquarium. And I said, well, what happened? He goes, well, I had these fish in there and I had the next door neighbor come feed them. 
and I told the next door neighbor who's a fortunate girl to be sure to close the lid on the top of the aquarium after you feed the fish. Well, she didn't do it. She opened the lid, put the fish food in, and walked away. He also had a cat. Oh. Everybody, everybody who has a cat in an aquarium, raise your hand. Because what does the cat do? The cat jumps up and he puts his paw in the water and the fish come up because they think that's the food hitting the water. And then he flips the fish out and eats them. Okay. So can you see what happened here? Obvious. What's he flipping? When he's flipping the fish, he's flipping salt water. Which is highly in, corrosive and conductive. And it went right into the power strip. And, and let's say the cat did not survive. And according to the official police report, the cat was the initial point of ignition. And I'll just leave it right there. Wow. wow. Um, <laughs> but it was our fault. Of course, it was all of our fault. Yeah, of course. And, you know, that's the kind of stuff that we dealt with, things like that. Okay. Um, so AST had three rounds of layoffs. So the first round was in three weeks. The second round was in six months. And after the six month layoff, Tandy, Tandy R&D, Tandy Research and Development was probably down to about eight people from a high of about 150. Wow. And I then left at that point. I didn't wait for the third round of layoffs. I, I left. I see. So it already, it kind of reminds me of how you started when you first walked into the back room of the tire shop. There was only a few people. It seems like you've come. There were six. Circle. Yeah. It went from yeah. six, probably at our peak, we had 400, six to 400 down to eight when I left. Well, we're jumping ahead of ourselves a little bit, but I wanted to find out what exactly, because I knew that that was a crucial role when AST became involved. But let's go back before that. Let's go back to the glory years, the time where Tandy really shined and you were making some fantastic components. And I actually have some questions. And one of them is from one of our admins at uh, Old Things Tan Tandy Radio Shack. His name is James. And he, he brings up a couple of things I didn't even know existed. Are you familiar with Tandy Zoomer? That rings the bell. I want to say this Tandy Zoomer was like a Palm Pilot thing. Like a, remember the old Palm Pilot, like the old App, Apple Newton? Mm -hmm. But that was third party. In other words, some other company came to Radio Shack and said, buy our thing. Oh, that was, okay. That was and not. Radio, and Radio Shack did that too, I guess. All the time. Mm -hmm. All the VCRs were from Hitachi for example. So Hitachi would come in and say, buy our 10-year-old crappy VCR for 50 bucks. And Bernie Appel would go, sold. <laughs> okay. So yeah, this was not uncommon. Remember from the last talk, depending so on- So I, I don't re recall it. So it probably wasn't that great of a success. No, in fact, we made fun of it because there was a kid show called Zoom at the same time with a bunch of little kids going zoom, zoom, zoom. <laughs> Everybody jump up and zoom, zoom, zoom. And we're thinking, what a stupid Okay, name. James got us another one here that I never heard of. And it's funny because my computer that I just built, I named it the same thing, Tandy Thor. Are you familiar with that? <laughs> I, 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 I wanted to warn you and, and give you these questions ahead of time. It's a whole chapter in my book, which I'll probably will never write, but it's a whole chapter in the book. All right, so I'll talk briefly about Thor. Okay, so Thor is the internal name. Remember we talked about last time, um, for example, okay, so this is the modem and a sensation right here. Okay, we all had code names, okay. So this was this was Luthor, like Lex Luthor, okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So that's Luthor, all right. And then this is the Model 3, Model 4 graphics card. It was called Katrina, okay. This is the audio development card in Sensation. I called it Wendy for Wendy Carlos, the synthesizer person, Wendy. Ah. So, so Thor was the internal name, all right? 
So Thor was going to be the world's first audio consumer read, write, erase CD player. Okay. Now today you can go on eBay and get a read, write DVD drive for $8. Okay. But when Thor was, we were working on Thor, this was magic. Oh, that was a big deal. Magic. Well, Thor had two parts. The first thing is you have to have the correct media. The CD, mm -hmm. the, the, the chemistry, and the laser to actually be able to read, write, erase, okay, on a drive. That was the chemistry part. Well, Tandy purchased the chemistry part from a company in California, all okay. right? So that was done outside of Tandy. There's more to the story, but you'll have to get the book. All right. <laughs> that hopefully will write someday. All right. So that problem was solved by other people. What we had to solve at Tandy Electronics was to make the physical guts of the hardware, mm -hmm. right? Which is in two parts. There's the audio record and playback channel. That's what I did. Audio in to record, audio out to play back. Mm -hmm. Then there's the read ride electronics for the laser and the motor, mm -hmm. right? That was headed up by a guy named Eric Schmidt, who was formerly part of a software development team. And he had about eight people in a little room that was a combination of digital engineers and software people. And he was in charge of getting the digital electronics to work, All right? Now, CD players, even when they came out, people, first when they came out, people hated them. The Sony CD1000, the first one, had awful analog electronics in it, and it sounded like crap. And so people were like, you'll take my vinyl from my cold dead hands. Okay. But as time went on, CD players got really, really good. So when we're doing Thor, that's about the time that CDs started to sound really good. And people were like, I hate CD players, but I'll take one. Okay. Just don't tell anybody. All right. So the audio quality was not the way it is today, but it was still pretty good. So I kind of had the easy job doing the audio stuff, that's my specialty. And so I was actually on a different floor in a different part of the building than the digital people, but I knew all of them, okay? And I knew who they were. What nobody knew was exactly how complicated a CD really is, all right? So we'll play CD trivia time. First question, on a standard audio CD, what percent of the data, you know, it's, all, it's digital data, right? It's encoded. What percent of all the data is the audio? One guess, what do you think it is? Uh, I would think that it's probably 20, 25%. What's the rest of it? Well, isn't it? Are we just talking about an audio CD or an audio? Yeah, I'm talking about an audio CD, not what percent of the disc is used. I'm talking if I read every bit. Allocation tables, probably fat or things that tells you where everything is. Well, you have a table of contents, so you know where track one and track two and track yeah. three I is. I would think that most of it is, is probably allocation, where everything oh. goes. So the answer is about 42%. Okay, well, a little, so what, a little short. Well, well, what you're talking about is 5%. That's called TOC, table of contents, all right? Like how long the tracks are, how many tracks you are, the name of the artist, the name of the song, blah, blah, blah. You know, the ID. So when you put the player in, it knows it's a CD. That's 5% of the data. The rest of it is error correction for fingerprints and scratches and things like that. Oh, wow. It's error correction, all right? But I had no idea about that. All right, next question, CD. So we all know that records go at 33 and a third RPM, LPs, right? 
What speed does a CD spin at? Thousands of RPMs, I think. Oh, it's, it's, like, it's hundreds. So it's hundreds. not thousands. So it's uh, probably it's hundreds. Three, four hundred RPM. What if I told you it changes speed three times a second? Really? And it goes from 300 to 600 RPM. Okay. But it changes the speed three times a second the whole time it's playing. All right. Wow. Why is that? That's my next question. Why does it change speed? Read because, different data? Because, all right, let's start off. So an LP reads the songs from the outside and goes to the inside, correct? CD starts at the inside and goes to the outside. So when you start in the middle, or toward, when you start in the end, and the thing is spinning, that data comes by really fast. And as you go out, it's going slower. But you want to have what they call CLV, constant linear velocity. So you want to have the bits that the laser is picking up coming at you at a pretty constant clock speed. Well, you can't do it because it's a spiral. So you have to change the speed of the motor depending on where you are to make that the bits come out constantly. I had no idea. Very people have no idea. All right. To give you an idea about the complexity of the data on a CD, the person who invented the CD format is an engineer named Toshi Doi from Sony. He literally did it by himself in a cube with a, with a HP 25 calculator and legal pads. He sat there on paper and did all the mathematics to prove he could do it before he did the first prototype. How long did he work on it? By, this is by himself, writing every day on legal pads. Months? 11 years. Wow. 11 years. So he must have started a, quite a long time, like a early, late 70s? Late 70s. Yeah. Mid 70s. Oh. <laughs> well, he had to spend four years to even remotely prove it could even be done. Okay. Could be done. So how was this all connected to Thor? That's really hard to do. <laughs> and if you're at Tandy and you're designing clock radios, and all of a sudden someone comes to you and says, boys, we're going to design us a CD writer. Now you have to know about Hamming codes, handing codes, read Solomon, Ford error correction, Galeois fields, eigenvalue calculus, you know, fast Fourier transform. And people are like, but I designed clock radios. So let's just say they were uh, a little overwhelmed. So but Thor was a pretty big project then, I guess, at the time. It was, a, it was the largest project of Tandy R&D at that point. Wow. And it was totally secret. Well, really? they, got, they got to the point where they had bits and pieces of the electronics working on this giant board, like four feet square plywood with like maybe 12 little circuit boards on it. All well, right. I could talk to you for hours about this. Your, but, your but yeah. information is so deep and we're well, already 30 minutes in and I got a lot more questions. All right, so let's just say it's really, really, really hard to do. Okay, <laughs> we'll leave it there. I think you made that vividly apparent. Okay, okay. so I've got another, and then this is, an interesting question too because i've always wondered about this the tandy acquisitions it seemed like tandy was doing a lot of song and dance towards the end to try to keep sales up and his question is what were the tandy acquisitions during your last tenure there um we're talking about maybe the grid or the victor things that you purchased were you around during that time I was those I was okay uh victor was you know european that was a European thing. Victor was after I left, but I was there for grid. I got sent to grid a lot of times. Mm. Um, so grid, grid was, was laptop, a, right? 
military only laptop yeah. in, in what's called Tempest. And Tempest is a federal Department of Defense standard for keeping emission, radiated emissions low so the Russians in a truck can't read your email by just- Were they pretty good systems? They were very good systems. They were very expensive, but they were very well engineered. They had solid magnesium cases. They had cold plates in there. I mean, they were, they had these really cool orange plasma displays. The displays cost grid $2,000 a piece. Really? Yes. That kind of thing. This was money is no object. We're not, you're not trying to hit a price point. That's not the point. It's not to hit a price. The point is Tempest. Hmm. We want a Tempest laptop because we don't care if you save $500 if the Russians can read our email. Okay. And I'm talking about not hacking. I'm talking about listening with an antenna. Okay. To the radiation emitted usually by the screen. Right. So if you say hello world on the screen. All right. If you listen, that goes, they go, that's hello world. That's beat me for lunch. Okay. That kind of a thing. So that's what grid was doing. Mm -hmm. All right. They, they bought grid because they had guaranteed income from government contracts. Does that make sense? Mm, it was absolutely. like, it was like, here's a bunch of POs. Good for contract grid. to grab. Right. So they got that. Plus they could kind of tout it, but that was never a Radio Shack thing. I mean, what's Radio Shack going to do with its $14,000 laptop? Okay. Um, so, so Tandy also, the only thing I remember big at that time that I paid attention to, remember, we're head down, we got projects to do, we can't look up very much and go, hey, what's over there? Or look down was um, Memorex, you know, cassette tape, the, mm. the tape division of Memorex, Tandy owned Memorex tape. And so I was involved with that for the DCC, the digital compact cassette, Another one of my many string of failures I had at Tandy Radio Jack. So I worked on DCC, failure, Thor, failure, VIS, failure, sensation, unless you're a fanboy, failure. So well, I have my thoughts on that, but we'll get to that in a minute. I'm which talking is about if you talk to Radio Shack. Yeah, you're right. And, it, and I guess if you look at it that way, it would be. Well, another question that he had was... Um, the AST transition, but we already talked about that. But I wanted to ask you about this because he mentions this here when he, he asks about the transition, uh, uh, the acquisitions. And I've always wondered that the Victor computer seemed to have morphed into the Sensation, the Model 10, and a few of those others. Is that true? Is that how it worked? I, I have no idea because I was not, I never said the word Victor the whole time I was there. Oh, really? It so was the sensation? the sensation? I can tell you it did not come from this. sensation. Well, the sensation was, it started sensation on before you acquired Victor. Before I don't Tandy. know because I don't care. I mean, I'm sorry, I just don't care. No, that's an honest answer. Well, well then, we're, okay. Well, then we'll just skip that for a minute because they, if you look at some of the Victor computers, because I had one, and you mm -hmm. put it next to a Model Ten, they look very similar, and that's why I wonder. Right. You have to understand you're talking to somebody who was not in the computer group. Okay. I was never in the computer group. I did work for the computer group. Well, this is confusing because Only we talked one. before and you said to me that you were very much involved in the designing of the sensation. I was. Yes. But I wasn't paid by them. They were different accounts. We had different divisions, okay? Okay, how many divisions does Sh Chevrolet have? They have a Corvette division, right? The Corvette people only design Corvettes. They're Corvette people. They design Corvettes. The Chevy- That's Bullock, probably all they care yeah. about. Right, the, Sh the Chevy- so I get you, I hear you, it okay. makes sense, well, I understand I was the now. guy that the bosses would say, Paul, for the next eight months, you're in the Corvette division then get your ass out of the Corvette division because we need you in the Volt division. So you bounced okay. around a lot. I just bounced. And okay. I didn't care. And I did not care what I did. I just did it. Okay. 
He didn't have time to say, I'm not working anywhere but the okay they just sent you there well you know it's funny because on our end there is it's there's a deeper love now especially for certain systems but we'll talk about that at another but, time i wanted to go over some questions from this guy john he, when i got I, I just got over some health issues and i was pretty sick for a while i'm on my i'm recovering now i'm not 100 percent, which is why i'm drinking a lot of water right now yeah <laughs> I'm not feeling too good today. I have good days and I have bad days. Today's not such a good day. Anyway, well, and I was really sick and we didn't know it was touch and go there for a while. John kind of took over the, the, the group, all things Tandy Radio Shack. And I, I relied on him and I trusted him immensely. Really good dude. Good to know. And I know you know him. Um, he asked a couple of questions. He asked, what was your involvement on the town Tandy Sound and all things legacy built into the sensation. I did all of it. It was all me. I mean, here you go. You're looking right well, at that's it. That's a simple question to answer. You just did it all. I did but everything. yet earlier you said you didn't really care. About, so you got to tell me that there was some love when you were putting that sensation. Well, I always, I. You Look, have to that understand. was a rocket ship system when it came out. Nothing was like that. Nobody you, had anything like that. You have like to that. understand that there's Tandy love, and then there's what happens when Radio Shack gets involved. Yeah. Okay. I know. It is a sad story. And it usually, I mean, to be honest, the last five years at Tandy, I went, I went one for four. And projects. Yeah, but I can't. That's then, awful. You can't I mean, be that's blamed awful. for any of those. I mean, I'm honestly, just saying, personally, I, I I couldn't wait to get out of there because I could imagine. I, I felt understand. like, what do I what do I have to do at this company to be a success? You okay? know, you, you touch on to a do? really good point, uh, Paul, because here you are building one of the greatest computers and this is coming from people that are engineer minded and have been doing nothing but working on systems so we all agree at that time that sensation was probably one of the best designed well-built machines ever at during that not saying ever but during that that time and that was pretty much based on what you're telling me designed by you built by you that to me Almost breaks my heart. Well, this does this, this, this wasn't just me. Okay. <laughs> I did that. It breaks my heart I, because you built one of the greatest there was, there machines six ever. People, there was me and five other people. Okay. Yeah, well, you it, you built one of the great computers ever at the time, up to that point, and it ended up but being but, part of a failing uh a, a corporation. But here's here here's the problem. And by then, who remembers PC magazine? You basically, your products lived and died over the PC Magazine review. Yeah. You didn't get editor's choice in PC Magazine. Didn't matter how good your stuff was. So where did you get your ideas about putting all those different legacy apparatuses into the sensation? How did you because decide that you, this is the kind of sound you want to drop in there? Where because, were you getting your thoughts? Were you gifted from God or do, what, what's what, what, what's well, going yeah. on here? Well, because I know this will be a shock to a lot of people, but Tandy was very formal in their products to be described on paper before we ever started. We were very formal. It wasn't like, hey kids, let's go design a multimedia computer. And everybody runs off. No, you had like a 500 page spec, okay? That you spent a whole year writing. No one's gonna design anything until we all agree what, it, what it's gonna be, all right? In this case, it was Microsoft. Microsoft wanted to push something called the MPC, the Multimedia Personal Computer. They want to have a little sticker like Intel inside. They want to have MPC inside so you could go to the store and go, oh, oh, MPC sticker, I'll buy that one. What did it mean? Microsoft had tested it, okay? Who knows what WHQL is? So when they tested it, did you see that and grab onto that and say, hey, this no, no, may we be were, an idea? No, 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 no. We were the guinea pig. Oh, they asked you to test it. No, start over. Bill Gates driving in his Porsche 9, 9, 959, whatever thing was. He's like, 
we need a multimedia personal computer, right? So he goes to his people and says, I want you to write a generic spec, not for any company, about what would we, what would Microsoft stick a sticker on that says, in our opinion, this is worthwhile to be called a multimedia personal computer. It has to have this and this and this and this and this, or it's not one because we said so. So you're saying Microsoft started the whole idea behind this sensation? No, they started the whole idea behind the MPC spec. Oh, I see now. They, I said it wasn't written. Okay, for I gotcha. It was a general purpose spec. Like so would it be fair to say that Tandy and you took that sensation idea, the MPC idea, and applied it to a new computer? We were the first computer to be branded MPC. Follow you now. I'm a little Microsoft. slow today. I'm under the weather, but That's I got okay. you now. Now That's I okay. can see how it was being built. Right. So Microsoft wrote, they started writing the spec based on software. It's going to use this version of Windows. It has to have this much memory. It has to have a CD-ROM drive. It has to have an audio system, right? It has to have, you know, four, four megs of RAM. You know, that high level, high level stuff, right? And then they threw it over the wall to me and said, now you refine it to be more exacting, like the audio. And like that's when the version one came out. Right. So I refine the audio specs, like it has to have this many watt speaker or it has to have line level outputs. It has to have front panel volume controls, you know, all that kind of stuff. All right. And so once the spec got to a point, Radio Shack and the buyer at Radio Shack, Barry, what's his name, whatever, he said, all right, we have enough to go on because remember, it takes a year to build these things, a year. So once the thing got going, we said, okay, I was off of voltmeters and suing people over, over stuff. They said, start working on it, right? So I started on the audio stuff. Rick Thompson was the senior lead digital guy. He started on the digital side. All right, Carl Wakeland was the chief video guy. He did started working on the video A6, okay? Um, so it started splitting up. We had two mechanical engineers. We had a guy that did the power supply, the one that blew up. Okay, all that yeah, kind of Yeah, I have stuff. one over here that well, blew up. Oh yeah, it's probably the reefer caps. We'll talk about reefer caps off one. Anyway, so the team got together, right? But I was like the liaison between Microsoft and oh, Andy key role. to make sure that Radio Shack wouldn't put something in there to make it cheaper that would break the NPC spec. That's the whole point of the whole thing to begin with. Wow, what a role to be in. Well, <laughs> I got to go to Microsoft a lot, okay? <laughs> they had really good food there. But anyway, um, so as far as the difficulty factor, to me, I had the easy part from the hardware standpoint. Mm. Although, you know, you look at this board and go- It looks pretty crap. complicated look for the that, time. Look at all that crap on there, okay? Yeah. Well, it's a lot of crap, but it's not necessarily hard crap. It's just a lot of crap, all right? So, but I spent a lot of time with our internal software people, because we had to write the drivers. Remember, this is Windows, and they had a giant, uh, probably 1,200 page document on all the multimedia, they called it multimedia extensions, MMX, multimedia extensions, to support sound and video and showing video, not only on a monitor, but on your TV set, and CD, CD-ROMs were kind of new, okay? so. We had audio CD-ROMs, but now we have multimedia CD-ROMs. Yeah. And they have, right. so the standards are in different colored books. They have the red book, the green book, the orange book, the yellow book. If the you have book. so much different in speed just on audio, I could imagine the trouble but, for and video so, too. And so we had a guy, so we had, so I was the hardware liaison and top level MPC guy. The software guy was a very famous person 
and that roar of Radio Shack, who tragically died last year, named Frank Durda. And Frank Durda, was, who was pushing VIS, was also pushing the software people to make sure that like the BIOS was compatible with, with the spec. Like we could support all the video modes. Remember Sensation and had all these video modes that other computers didn't have. Well, how do you define those in the BIOS? Well, you have to say, well, that's BIOS call 43. Well, no one's done 43 before. So we have to like reserve 43 and make sure that, you know, Hercules doesn't use it for some damn thing for their light pin, that kind of thing. So I did a lot of system, system architecture for the sensation, okay? Like I had to source the CD-ROM drive. I had to, had to source, you know, the speaker. We talked about David Konetsky and the speaker debacle, that kind of a thing. And so it finally came together and then it sold okay. We tried to, the main problem with the sensation was try to convince people we didn't take a VIS and put it in a better case. Well, according to some of the people that I spoke with who were still with Tandy at that time, the biggest problem with the sensation was there wasn't enough of them. They ran out. They sold really, they sold really well, really quickly, and then they ran out. So what did they run out of? Well, I, from what I heard, it was the complete unit. I mean, having no, a unit no, to sell. No, no, but I'm saying when you're at the Tandy factory. Yeah, on the make... ground floor, what did you run out of? CD uh, how come you didn't make more than 50,000? Because we bought the cheapest Mitsumi CD-ROM drive they made and Mitsumi didn't want to make them anymore because they were cheap and nobody wanted them but Tandy. Wow. Think That's about hard why. drive. Okay, we call this the hard drive paradox. So here was the hard drive paradox all through Tandy. Wow. We want a... 40, 40 megabyte hard drive and this computer. So we go to Seagate and we order a bunch of 40 megabyte hard drive. What I was told- Wait, wait, hang was, on, hang on. Let me finish the story. All right, okay. So, this is important. Don't want to cut you off. I thought you were through with no, no, that thought. No, this is, I'm making a point about Mitsumi. Okay. This is something that people don't think about. This is insider information at its finest. <laughs> all right. Then by all means, go ahead. All right. So we buy 150,000 40 meg drives. Right. A year later, Western Digital comes to us and says, We got a brand new 60 megabyte drive. And Tandy goes, No, thanks. We'll take the 40. Western Digital goes, um, See, we, we don't, we don't want to make the 40 anymore. We only want to make the 60. Okay. We, We've retooled the factory. So Tandy says, that means you're going to give us a big discount on the 40s, right? Western Digital said, no. In fact, we're going to raise the price 10%. Wow. To force you to buy the 60. And he's like, you can't do that. You can't do that. If it's bigger, it's more expensive. You can't charge more if it's smaller. Well, that's what Western Digital did. So every year, so the joke was at Tandy, every year, so we paid about $100 a piece for hard drives. And we paid $100 for a hard drive every year for 15 years. The difference was when we started, they were 40 meg. When we ended, they were 40 gig. But they were still $100. So Western Digital didn't say, hey, we got some old 40 megabyte drives for $3 if you want them. No. Well, that's what Mitsumi wanted to do with the CD-ROMs. How many people went through CD-ROMs and they go, it's 1X, it's 2X, it's 4X, it's 16X, it's 32X, right? Well, that's the read speed, right? Well, if, if you're Mitsumi and you're trying to compete with Sony and Philips, the big boys, you want to, to have your read speed be as fast as possible. That's something you can market. Well, why would you want a 16X drive when you got some 32X drives over there? And you like, because you want to only pay $1.50 for them. <laughs> so we gave Mitsumi an order for like 30,000 2X. These were two, 
two, the number two, two X drives. And when we went through double them, speed, we went through them. We came back and said, we want to buy a million more. And Mitsumi says, uh, I think we've got some in the warehouse, but no more than that. And that's when we started doing the sensation too. The version two. That was forced by Mitsumi. Interesting. Because remember, what were the original drives in the sensation one had what kind of drives? The caddy drives, right? Remember? I still have a few of those working. Well, they weren't in a tray, right? You had trays and you had caddy. So you would put the CD-ROM in this little plastic caddy. And Everybody caddy, thought at that time the CDs were very delicate. You could explode and kill people if you dropped it. Well, what, what it found out was that, well, the caddy had another purpose that had nothing to do with protection. What do you think it was? I have no idea. What would it the kept, other purpose be? It kept the CD from vibrating when the motor spun at 600 RPM. Because of, of the wind, the velocity inside the caddy? Part of it and, and the Bernoulli effect, which mm. is how airplanes fly and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. All right? Turbulence. Right. So they had trouble at 2X, okay? But what they found out was instead of putting all of their design effort in making a caddy where it doesn't vibrate, okay? Because now they're all, they're, I mean, they're, they're all trays, right? So you how many people remember putting the 32 CD-ROM drive, especially a light scribe winner, and it sounded like a washing machine. It's like, brruh, 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 brruh. okay? That damn, that thing's hopping around like a bunny rabbit in a hot plate. The CD-ROM is doing this the whole time, but they didn't care. Why? In case in that caddy, I guess you'd be fine. Because the electronics fixed it all for you. They oh, really? It. They didn't fix it mechanically. They fixed it in the digital chips, which are cheap to do. So they didn't care if it was hopping around and jumping like that. They went, eh, we can handle it. Mm. And so Mitsumi didn't want to make caddy drives. They want to make tray drives. In fact, I think the fastest tray drive went up to 64X. Right so this whole thing, the reason why there wasn't that many of the Tandy Sensation version one was because of that CD-ROM. Correct. Wow. That leads me to one more question then. This is also from John. Is it true that the Tandy 3100 morphed into the Sensation? Did you use the basis of the 3100 to build this version one Sensation? I can't answer that because the, that's a digital design question for Rick Thompson. Maybe, maybe we one get day Rick you'll, Thompson on. Maybe one day you'll get, you'll, he's extremely shy. But Rick Thompson. I can open people up. Look what I've done with you. <laughs> I'm the opposite of Rick Thompson, okay? No, I believe I'm not, you. I'm like, me out of well, my closet. Well, he shut up already? No. <laughs> the per, the, so if you're, if you're trying to find the one person responsible for designing the most computer stuff at Tandy, it's Rick Thompson. He's the one guy who's designed the most things for the longest period for Tandy, Rick Thompson. And he lives here in Fort Worth and he's a really nice guy and he's a scratch golfer. So I've been trying to get him. I almost had him talked into going to Tandy Assembly this year until COVID hit. I want to catch that one. I was sick this last one I missed, but I want to catch that Well, I'm not again. going, so, so you guys Why? Are you not happy with him? No, it's COVID. I'm not going. I'm, a, I'm not, I'm not going to take Boy, that sounds like a, a, like a part three, but we're almost out of time. So. All right, so more questions. You got time for a few more questions. What else do you want yeah. to ask? Yeah, well, um, those are the only two that I. Uh, those are the only questions I had from my admin. What? But there's I had. No, there's no VIS. I, well, I have a. I have a couple questions. <laughs> One of them is because I am currently working on my sensation that uh -huh. Mark gave me, and with that, uh, I have this power supply. And you were I telling me, and I read that there is something about the caps that you were saying that. Which one of these caps are, are are you telling me is the ones to look at? Would it be in? No, 
the okay. this area? No, the other end of the board. It's where the AC, okay, see where the AC connector is? The AC power? All right, look right behind it. There's a big rectangular cap. Okay. That one. There, okay. Generically, they're called RIFA, R I F A, RIFA. That was an Italian company who invented that capacitor for that function. And the function is it goes right across your AC power lines to prevent radiation from the power supply getting into your house wiring. Well, you know your caps. I can see the name, Rifa. Who are you talking to, buddy? Who are you talking to? <laughs> I'm challenging you what all the time. What do I have time? to do around here to get... <laughs> hey, yeah, you get some respect, right? I got some kind of credibility problem. Hey, no, believe me. If it, if I'm falling short, I apologize. Okay. I think you are your your mind is beyond recognition in my book. I can't so, even think how you did all the things you've done. So Rifa invented this cap that was literally used in hundreds of millions of power supplies for 30 years, and then they all, like 99% failed, and they fail as a dead short, which causes them to catch fire. And if you don't believe me, go to YouTube and type R-I-F-A space F no, I believe I you. R E. Reef I believe fire. you. I'll tell you why I believe you, because they were that particular cap that you're talking about is inside those compact suitcases. It's that in power every reefer capacitors are literally in every single switching. That's a switching power supply made from 1981 to 2005. Oh, they pop like an M80. I've had a few of those where yeah. I plugged them in and, and yeah. there's bam. other there's other problems, but those are always the problem, always. Interesting. And a lot of them will crack, and a lot of them will catch fire, and it smells like a burning tire when they catch fire. Yeah, they do stink. Yes. So the first thing you do is you replace the reefa cap, and you can get – you don't replace it with another reefa because companies like Panasonic and AVX and Nichicon have – so, because the patent has run out. So as I'm a patent expert, the patent ran out so other companies can make them and they fixed that problem with them breaking. So you can go to Mouser and DigiKey and get a drop-in replacement for about 85 cents. Wow. And what I do is I just buy, buy a bag of 50 of them and eventually I'll use them up. Interesting. Well, so I that's what you do. do that. And if you look at the cap, it'll have a value and a voltage rating. It'll say something like 0 .0 0.1630 volts or something like that. And, it's, and then well, the other thing you have to do is match up the size so the leads will go in the board. Right, some of them are right. bigger. Well, even if bigger. I'm a little bigger or smaller, I can fix right. that. So well, I'm, we've come pretty much to the end of the line, but I wanted to ask you. I'm one... just getting started. Let's go for another hour. Come on, are you kidding me? Come on, let's go, let's go. Hey, Come we on, may do a part three. For popular demand, we may do a part three. I could tell I've just touched the surface. But here's my final question to you. And this one's kind of a sincere question because you have to understand that there are so many people now, and I meet them every day, who think Radio Shack and their computer division, Tandy, was probably, and their engineers that filled it, some of the best in the world. What are your thoughts on being part of Radio Shack at that time? When you look back at it, do you look back on it with fondness? Are you angry, say, bitter? Well, the old joke about mixed feelings is when your mother-in-law drives over the cliff in your brand new Cadillac. <laughs> so if you talk to all the engineers there, most of them are, they have mixed feelings, okay? Um, it was completely the wild, wild west over there. Um, management. Texas. Well, management. I see that. Management. I think when people are talking about that time, not Radio Shack, Tandy, not Radio Shack, Tandy, that to this day, 
I really and truly feel that they didn't 100% believe computers were important. Mm, interesting. They just, they were kind they of made like so much money. I'm just telling you from my perspective. No, I believe you. They, the, the, they had no emotional attachments like say, you know, Steve Jobs is number one. Okay. He had, he was a hundred percent. Okay. Elon Musk is a hundred percent invested in Tesla and SpaceX. Okay. So no matter what you think about these people personally, I'm talking about this one factor about every soul of their being is invested in what they do, whether you believe it or not, or whether you think, oh, his father owned a numeral mine, or he was a jerk, or whatever. It, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about they are 100%. That's all they think about. People, the management at Tandy, when they thought about computers, they just go, Mm. I guess we'll just keep doing them and some, you know, it's just whatever. Does that make you sad when you look back at it? It's not sad. It makes me angry. Mm. And, and what I tell people on both Tandy and Radio Shack is that they had the keys to Fort Knox handed to them on a nice velvet pillow. And both of them went, there's got to be a catch. Hmm. It can't possibly be this simple. There's got to be something that we're not seeing. There's there's something there that you're not telling me. Oh, I'm not sure I want the keys. Uh, I might let somebody else pick them up for a while, but can I give them back if I don't like it? They just didn't have the level of commitment that everybody else did. I, I, I always wonder what would have happened if- Engineers if, ran the company? If the engineers, well, even if they listened to us, mm. even if they just listened to what we were saying and, and took it to heart, but it was, it, I mean, all the, I mean, I'll give you one more example. Computer Shopper Magazine, let's go back I keep harping, but this is important. The role of Computer Shopper Magazine, I think was the single biggest factor in how people thought about computers was Computer Shopper Magazine. And here's why. Before Computer Shopper Magazine, God, these things are like magic from Star Trek. You open it up and there's probably aliens inside. And you have to be a genius to understand computers. By default, the most mind-boggling thing that people talked about since the 1950s were robots and computers. And they were tied to spaceships and aliens, right? And if you told people, yeah, what is that on computers? They go, oh my God, okay? You're like one step below Nobel Prize astronauts, okay? Well, what happened was Computer Shopper said, just buy this crap and screw it together. Oh, I know it was a rough words, time. In other words, you don't have to build a computer by soldering parts together. You can build a computer with a screwdriver. <laughs> you can. In fact, and, you can. And all and of a sudden, let me apologize real quick for the noise you're hearing because um, we have a hot fax come in. <laughs> well, no, this is interesting. This is pertaining to what we're doing right now. I actually, before I listed this, I did talk to a couple of people that I know, some followers of our group. Uh, and I told them, if you got a question, just send it through this uh, IP, which would print out on my printer. And I just got two questions go. real fast because we're almost out of time. All right, I'll do they're fast. Not really, they're not really questions. They're statements. Okay. And now it's starting to light up. It, and it, this is important because you need to hear this. And I like the way this gentleman wrote, uh, wrote this. So what Paul doesn't understand is that he was part of something that is very big, something that'll never be forgotten. And that's true. You, you, you seem to forget that, for instance, like on Facebook, some of the fastest growing groups on Facebook 
are anything connected to Tandy Radio Shack. Our group is all almost looking at 3,000 members. We didn't form that long ago, and I'm the founder, and I got sick, and it still kept rolling without right. me. So what he's trying to say here is that you need to remember this. Don't be angry because you left a legacy, and people now are looking back at what you did and how strong of a mind you were to create these things against all of that turbulence. Right. And you're, you're, you, we, we look at you in, in high regard, Paul. You, you've done right. a tremendous thing, and no matter how much time goes, that's a legacy that will never be forgotten. Well, you know, the thing is, you never asked me the question. You just got a compliment, I'll, man. I'll answer you. No, I'll answer. Are you proud of what you did? The answer is yes. If you talk to me and Rick Thompson, okay, yeah. And some of the other people who worked on the color computer, like John Prickett, who's down in Austin, okay, will tell you that at that time, right, we're in Fort Worth, Texas, arguing over who took my scope probe, all right, mm -hmm. and we were kicking IBM's ass that had 50, you know, PhDs arguing in Boca Raton about what color the power switch should be, okay. We actually did it, all right? And we did it with our hands tied, all right? That's People, an amazing thing. And so, and so we're proud of that, okay? Don't get me wrong. We're proud yeah. of that. We just wish it hadn't ended the way it had. Hadn't been so ugly. Right, and, and, and along the way, we wish that even one time that we would have been recognized for what we were actually doing as opposed to being a bunch of whiny engineers who want to be happy just having a job, damn it. Paul, that's what's happening now. That's why we're talking. I am honored to spend this time with you. I think you're a great guy. These last minute questions that come in and said, don't forget to let him know how great we think he is that he had to battle amongst all this adversity to create. Yes, you should have a big head because you did a fantastic thing and you are being honored now for something you should have been honored back then. Yes. And, and I really appreciate the time that you took with us with this. Um, I, I'm very thankful. I think you're a great guy. Talking with you is just a, a seriously, you should be a speaker somewhere. <laughs> you are very... Well, like I said, there's videos of me talking on YouTube for hours on end. Oh, no, I, I've watched them all. <laughs> Just type no, no. all I don't, I don't get you. I don't, I, you know what? Some of those are okay. But I got to tell you, when you talk to me, I can I can bring out that that man in you and just make you. Uh, it's, it's a fun thing to watch. Oh, well, you know, you talked about, you know, advertising. I do have a Patreon. Oh, I mean, that's, I'm, I'm where, so glad you mentioned where, that. Where you pay so much per month. And so. I have videos on there talking about musical electronics or electronics in general, okay, at like the $10 and $25 a month level that are all edited and they have soundtracks and they're all color corrected so you don't see all this shining off my head. And it's, it's just go to <laughs> patreon.com and it's synthesis underscore technology. Well, here's what we're going to do because I got a lot of these that I want to go over oh, myself. Okay. But we're Keep running going. out of time. So what Keep I'm going to do is I'm going to talk with you later, and we're going to link on to this uh, cap, uh, this talk to all the different things that you're doing. I know you have a group. Um, I, I want to link your Patreon. Uh, it seems to me like these people are so excited about listening to you. They're willing to give you money. So am I. <laughs> well, just remember, again, it's not Tandy stuff. If, you, if you're on Facebook, and I know a lot of people don't like Facebook because of politics, including me, but if you're on Facebook, just go to the search bar at the top left corner and type three words, mostly, M-O-S-T-L-Y, mostly true tales, T-A-L-E. That's your group. No, that I'll make it easier. I'm going to send a leak on this where they can just click on it. Boom, it'll go right there. I'll take right. care of that. And send, send a join request and sure. I'll approve it. And I'll set that link up. That's the title of my book I hope to write someday called Mostly True Tales. And just go down the page, scroll down, and you'll see some videos 
that I've given about Tandy Radio Shack, and you'll see some excerpts from the book, topics from the book. So just right. scroll down a ways, and I'll give little, little snippets of what's going to be in the book. So the book is going to be an historical telling, mainly not to pat myself on the back, because I've already got a crick on my neck doing that today, <laughs> but it's about basically giving the names of people, because how many people can name engineers at Apple? They don't want you to know their names. Engineers okay. at IBM. No, you don't know any of those people. We've okay. already spent an hour today talking about how great of a job you're doing uh, or you did back then. And I want everyone to realize that. And it's funny that these, they came in right when they did. And I apologize, my printer is right next to my microphone. But What's it's another really one? interesting that, um, I mean, I've got pages now of people who say, hey, don't forget to tell them how great we think he is. And it's not about what happened to you at that time and or how angry you are now. It's about what you did, and wait, they can never wait. take that away from you. Is, is this being live streamed? Uh, no, no. What yeah. I did was I said, I said to them, um, just, well, this is that's not me. necessarily true. There is a, a small group of about 12 people that are reading this live through my IP address, but I did not put it out there for everyone. You mean, you mean watching or reading? No, watching. Watching, okay watching us but there's only 12 they were on a sub list <laughs> that guy and, didn't have any pants okay on. well you know what's really interesting let me count one i'll bet you got one two, from everybody i bet you got 12 of them yeah one two three four five oh no half six That's six good. people and they're all pretty much saying the same thing don't end without letting them know what a that we all realized that he no, did a great job at Tandy. He was he was not at that time he was victimized, ridiculed, and hammered for the lack of. Oh, I guess it's the the your your allotment. You when you when people buy stuff from you, they cut like what you were saying. They cut down. Well, let's get this cheaper CD-ROM. And things like yeah, that. So was, you were, you was, were building great things, even though you were restricted. We were restricted, what I think, artificially. And that if you if there's a common complaint from all the engineers, because the engineers had to you know meet a cost goal, is that we were artificially restricted because that's the only way that Tandy knew how to do business. They didn't know any other way. All right. Starbucks. This is my parting shot. Why does Starbucks even exist? So imagine the head of Starbucks goes into a bank. He wants a loan to start Starbucks. Guy at the bank says, what's your business, sir? He goes, coffee. I want to sell really good coffee. I'm going to have these really cute girls called baristas that are going to give you the coffee. Yeah, I'm going to write your name, name on it. Just for Starbucks. You know, so right? And the guy says, well, that's good. What are you going to sell the coffee for? The guy says, seven bucks. <laughs> the guy says, the guy says, excuse me, seven dollars. Coffee's a quarter. <laughs> he goes, this coffee's seven dollars. And you're going to line up 30 deep to pay for it. And the guy says, you're out of your mind, right? It's good coffee, though. FedEx, FedEx. You're going to pay us $11.95 to put six sheets of paper in an envelope and mail it overnight anywhere in the country. Buddy, I've got a fax machine right here. <laughs> what do I need you for? That's I get your point. And with that, right. so, so so here's 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 the engineers at Tandy. So we're Starbucks, we're FedEx, Tandy. I mean, we're we're that Radio Shack is the bank. Yeah, no, I understand. We got this great multimedia computer. And you know what? According to the the the, the, 
the the chosen few that I allowed to give my because it's my open IP and I didn't want That's that right. out on the internet. Um, they all feel the same way, and I, I am so glad that they sent these in right when they did. With that, Paul, we do have to run because we're going over an hour. Look, seriously, it was an honor speaking with you. You, you, I'm glad you took the time to talk to me. And the fact that this is going to be recorded for all time now, we'll get this. And then I'm going to send the leaks and set that up again. Okay. Paul, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. All right. And we'll talk to you again. I know it's not over. Give me a couple of weeks. I got, I'm kind of busy. Maybe and the I'm end gonna, of Okay. I'm going to set up some links before I put this on out there. Okay. Okay. You, you take care, Paul. All right. Bye-bye. Talk to you soon. Bye.